Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you, Lord. We are grateful today to be in your house, to feel your spirit, to be among your people, O Lord, to have health and life and strength. Lord, I pray today that you would let your spirit cover this class. Let it bless, God, each and every class, teacher, our kids, God, our teens. Lord, minister to this adult class. Let your spirit, God, of peace and joy, God, let it move upon our hearts and minds today. Rest upon us, God, and bless the remainder of this day. Bless our gifts to God offering today. We pray in the name of Jesus and everybody say amen. Lord bless you. I'll let you be seated. And uh, we're just going to try to jump into the word of the Lord this morning. And uh, I am intentionally trying not to be too, uh, too heavy on your hearts in my teaching today. I want to encourage you. I want the word of the Lord to bless you. So I want to direct you today to Luke chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse number 8. And uh, we're just going to read a little bit familiar portion of scripture about the birth of Jesus Christ. Scripture says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. They, they weren't used to this uh, supernatural visitation. Next verse, please. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, notice this, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. I want to teach this morning uh, for a short time, hopefully. You guys can smile. We've got the warm air going. I see you guys just kind of settling in on. <laughs> Might have to open the doors and windows and wake you back up. But I want, I want to share today on this subject, the need of the season. The need of the season. And I will tell you up front, I am uh, departing uh, today from our regular scheduled Sunday school curriculum topic because as I started going into the subject for today, I realized that that subject was actually in, in great part identical to what I felt like God was directing me to speak in our 11 o'clock hour. So uh, I just continued to kind of follow a, a pattern but found a little bit different vein. And uh, so you'll find the one will just blend into the other as we go into our 11 o'clock hour. But as I begin to read this uh, very familiar portion of Scripture, the time of the birth of Christ, the shepherd's experience with the angel beginning to direct them and the great star, I, I, I recognize something that I guess maybe just had never stood out to me before. And that was the, what happened in verse number 13. And, and you can put that back up for me, Brother Berkeley, if you want, and just hold that there for a minute. We have to understand, again, we have these shepherds. They are having a supernatural experience. There is, the scripture is very clear, it is singular. There is one angel that is speaking to them, visiting with them, and that singular angel has created uh, fear in their heart. Uh, they're, they're troubled by what they're seeing because this is not just an everyday occurrence. Now, I mean, let, let me just ask you, how many of you have an angel show up and talk to you every day? Because, I mean, while, while it would be a great and exciting to say, man, I, 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 was, I was standing on the street corner and this angel showed up, that would be wonderful. How many of you encounter devils every day? That's a little different. Uh, but this angel is, is talking 
and he's declaring that good things are coming. Fear is on them. And then all of a sudden, based on what is being communicated by this one angel, all of a sudden, the Bible says suddenly, you got to get the picture. Man, if they were not already afraid. All of a sudden, you've got a whole choir, a whole multitude of angels, of heavenly hosts, began praising God, and the way that they're praising God, this is what they're saying. Let's go to verse 14 again. This whole host begins to say in unison, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, where you are, shepherds, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And I, I kind of get the idea that this was kind of maybe, a, it's just my interpretation, but kind of a song. And they just kept repeating, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And when I began to read this this morning, I began to see maybe this scripture and setting from a different perspective because I've always tried to look at it from the shepherd's perspective looking upward. But I have to realize that the response of this angelic host was not an upward look, but rather a downward perspective. It wasn't a shepherd or our perspective of looking up and saying, man, this is gonna be great if God comes down. But these are the angels, the heavenly hosts that dwell in the heavenlies with God. And they're saying, we're trying to tell you what's coming. We don't want you to get stuck on just a babe in a manger of a child wrapped in swaddling clothes, of the mechanics of travel and discovery. We want you to understand what this means in your world. But it's also the perspective of these angels, these heavenly hosts, they've got the picture from the beginning. They're saying this is all about the glory of God. What we're seeing God do, robing himself in flesh and coming to earth, man, this is glory to God in the height. This is the most magnificent thing that God has ever done. You, you got to get the picture. They're, they're, they're looking, they're saying, you, you've got creation. We've got the days of creation. We've been with him through this whole thing. But God is doing something greater than he has ever done. It's glory to God in the highest degree. They're trying to get the shepherds and even to us, they're wanting the shepherds to elevate their praise and their reception of all that God is doing. Then they go a little further. And they said, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now we, we interpret it as, you know what? Because Jesus has come, we should show goodwill one to another. These angels are saying, this is the goodness of God toward men. They're looking, they're saying, we don't understand it all. We don't even know why God has anything to do with you. We don't even know why he would want to come down to earth. We don't know why he would want to do all that he's doing. But I got to tell you, when God starts coming into your world, it's goodwill toward men. God is shining his goodness. But it's that middle phrase, on earth, peace that captured me. Because these angels, these heavenly hosts, they understood exactly what was supposed to happen when God dwelt in a place. They were speaking comparison of the atmosphere of the heavens compared to the activities that they saw on the earth. When they were looking from the heavenlies, they saw a world that was corrupt, a world that was in unrest, a world that was in torment, a world and lives that were broken, corrupt. Amazingly enough, they saw what we now see. 
And they're saying from our perspective, if you shepherds and if humanity can embrace the king of glory and the fact that he's coming in his highest act of favor and goodwill toward, if you can get it right in relationship, said it's going to bring peace on the earth. This was their perspective. And as I began to look, I realized the need of the season, truly of every season, but particularly here and now in this season and time of life, we need the peace of God. We need the peace of God on our minds. We need the peace of God in our hearts, in our homes, in our world. It... it, Maybe it's too honest of a confession, but you know, I've spent a lot of years where I'm just being honest. I I didn't pray for peace on earth. I prayed for just peace for me and my family. But I have to tell you, I'm looking at a world that's hurting. I'm looking at lives that are so torn. Our our society at large has become dismantled and is unraveling. I, I, was, I was reading an, an article this morning just about uh, the concern because in Alaska alone, during the last year, there have been 20 people that are a part of our military that have committed suicide. The numbers are going higher and higher. We're not, but that's just in the military. And the military, literally, in the previous year, threw two hundred and fourteen million dollars into trying to help people find peace of mind. And yet, the numbers are escalating. We're seeing this as a prevalence across the world. The Bible tells us that in the last days, that men's hearts shall fail them for fear. We're seeing people that they're they're afraid. They're afraid of everything and everyone. They're afraid of tomorrow. They don't know what to do. The world is is just in in a turmoil. And if there is any peace to be found, I have to tell you again, it's only going to be found in Jesus Christ. It's only, I mean, I don't have all the answers, but I do have the answer. And I know that sounds really bold and really big. And I know we got problems in the church and Christians still have problems. But I got to tell you, I have an answer for a $214 million investment of the government. And it's not another dollar and it's not another program. But it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is the need for the season, which is peace. And, And we have to, the angels were saying, if you get God right. He's bringing peace. He's going to be your answer to the turmoil. And so today, again, I find myself in this morning praying a fresh God. I understand we're living in the last days. I understand that the Bible tells us that the enemy is going to intensify his warfare in the last days because he knows his time is short. And I know, Lord, that people that live without you and live in sin, God, unless they choose to repent, I I cannot help them. But God, I'm praying somehow. Would you send peace into our world? Because we've got kids that are, they're broken hearted. We got kids that are checking out a life as adolescents, as children that aren't even teenagers yet and they don't feel like life is worth living. And I just got to be honest with you. I grew up in a home with a whole lot of trouble, but my childhood was one of the most exciting times of my life. What has happened to our world? It's a world that has dismissed God. It's a world that has said God doesn't exist. It's a world that says we don't need God. We we can satisfy ourselves. But the statistics tell us something so different. And the angels were trying to tell us in the beginning, don't bring God down to your level, but worship him in his highest because his intention toward you was his greatest act of glory. And know that when you have God, When you embrace him, when you bring him into your heart, your mind, into your home, your family, your soul, your life, your church, guess what you get? Peace. I've taught about it before and I've come to live by it more and more. When I find myself unsettled, 
when I find myself starting to get anxious about something or anything, it tells me somehow I'm being distracted by the wind, as I taught about here or preached about Wednesday night. Something else is called, I got to get my attention back on God and make sure I am securely connected with Him because when I get in relationship with Him, all of a sudden everything else just settles out. Nothing else matters anymore. Not, not, that it, not that it isn't important. It just doesn't matter. Yes, sir. I know that sounds contrasting, but that which was so vital now becomes insignificant because I have found the only significant thing in life, which is Jesus Christ and His peace in my life. Yes. And so it was just a very unique setting, and I, again, realized the need of the season is peace. And I wish I could say that our peace is never challenged, Sister Becky. But we have our own circumstances in our life. Um, very, very dear friend lost her mother yesterday, a pastor's wife. I got a call day before yesterday of a from a young wife and small children, a couple that I married her and her husband several years ago. Her 35 year old husband died in the night. That'll unsettle you. It will unsettle you. And unfortunately for this young couple that the husband passed away, they, they were not presently living for God. And so there's all the torment of all these questions and things. I want to tell you, it pays great dividends to wake up every morning and look and say, you know what, the fact that Jesus Christ came as a baby and lived and suffered and died and rose again, it is glory to God in the highest and on earth. Can, can, I, can I break it down? Earth is always typed in the scripture to flesh. So in my life, in my flesh, in my world, it is peace because God is still in control. He is omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's got everything under control. And he will cover me and he will protect me. And therefore I can go to bed at night with peace in my heart. I, I, I pray. I pray that God would never take my spouse in the middle of the night. I love you too much. I don't want to lose you. We joke sometimes, but again, but I'm in all seriousness. If God's going to take one of us, I want him to take me first. <laughs> but she says, no, she wants to go first. <laughs> so we say, we'll just both go together. <laughs> And Cher says, that's not fair. You both can't leave me. <laughs> so we just have to rest in God and know that, you know what? If we live right, we're going to die right. And we're going home to be with Jesus. And whoever is left behind is going to have peace in their heart and glory unto God in the highest. Why? Because everybody always wants you to stay here. But I recognize there, there's coming a day when, when God is going to call me home. And when he calls me home, you know what? I'm ready to go today. Right. Yes, sir. Right. I'm, not, I'm not saying that arrogantly. No. 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 To the best of my ability and my knowledge and with much repentance, very often, I want to tell you, my heart is prepared to meet Jesus. Amen. So I don't have to get stressed out over everything in life. Right. This is what God intended to bring. Yeah. But it comes by proper relationship with him. But in this season, again, there's all the mixed emotions of loved ones that have passed on. There's the struggle of financial times and hard times. In the middle of it, you've got a pastor that's pushing for gifts to God and giving more to God than you've ever given. And you're going, Lord, what do I do? I want to give more, but God, it looks like I might have less. And you're, you're... Don't stress. Don't stress. Because everything that you have is what God gave you. Therefore, it doesn't belong to you anyway. 
And the most frustrating time of your life will be when God's trying to speak to you, let go of something he lets you hold on to, and you're trying to hold on to it instead of letting it go. Just relax, because glory to God in the highest. Everything in our life comes from him. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from above. It is the Father's good pleasure to give unto his children. Oh, come on, somebody. This is, the Lord will bless us. We just have to freely we have received. Freely we got to be willing to give. I'm not on the giving yet. I'm talking about this. I'm talking about living with peace in your life. It's right relationship with God. It's not God gets some and I get some. It's God gets everything and I get the overflow of his blessing. I get the benefit of his goodness. And knowing that just puts me at peace. You know, Brother Gabriel, you and Sister Amber, you guys, you guys made kind of a radical decision. What were you thinking? <laughs> Pack up your family. Quit your job. How many years? 18. 18 years. With the same company. And thought you were going to get to transfer and bring all that 18 year seniority with you. And they told you, oh, you can come, but you don't get to take your seniority with you. See? Something, that don't seem fair, does it? No. That's just not even right on anybody's scale except a child of God. That Why did you move? Because God called us here. Say it. God called us here. Huh? God called us here. Do what? He said, come. <laughs> and you had questions. You had concerns. But we prayed our way through it and said, God will grant you peace. And when you find that peace, you make the transition and you found that peace trusting him. Not worrying about your future. In the meantime, God provided Sister Amber with another job to be able to work at home. God put all the pieces in place. This is what happened. You don't have to work out your future. Some of you need to get more in the book. The Bible says the Lord himself shall choose our inheritance for us. Yeah. Man, we're always trying to figure out how to provide for ourselves. I'll tell you how. Let God provide for you and you'll always have more than enough. I'm having fun today. I love the word of God. So let's just look. At what God said about peace, about how to how to discover peace, what's the process? Just some scriptures. Let's look at Matthew chapter six, beginning with verse twenty-five. Therefore, I say unto you, boy, he just gets the Lord sometimes just goes right for the juggler vein. He said, "Before I tell you how it's going to turn out, I need you to forget about yourself." Take no thought for your life. And then, man, he just gets... What you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. He said, come on, give me a break. Is not life more than meat in the body than raiment? He said, life's about more than what you eat and what you wear. Yeah. Oh, Lord, help us. I'm going to keep moving before I get myself in trouble. <clears throat> he said, take a look at the fowls, the birds of the air. He said, they, they don't plant crops. They don't, they don't go through a harvest season. They don't have barns to gather all the stuff that they planted and harvested and put in for another year. He said, yet your heavenly father, which by the way is me, not me, but him. Feeds them. Why does he feed them? Why does God feed the birds? Shout out at me here. Because he made them. He's responsible for them. They're his babies. They had a purpose in his master plan. And so he said, if I can create you and have a purpose for you, you better understand I intend on providing for you. Amen. I'm 
some of the things that we try to, to, to wrangle around to make sense out of God's word, we just mess up the simplicity of it. I mean, even when we're talking about people coming to God, we're like, well, all I know is one thing, man, that they're going to have to kick that habit and they're going to have to stop doing this. And they're going to have to stop doing that. And this is going to have to change it, man. That's going to be so. No, they need to repent and be baptized in Jesus name, be filled with the Holy Ghost and the spirit will lead them and guide them into all truth. Folks, it's really not difficult to see people change. See, it's difficult for people to change or want to change. But the process is simple. And the beautiful thing about it, let me just again take the responsibility off of you. You don't have to fix anything in their life. Boy, this gets fun. You don't even have to tell them, in your opinion, what's right and what's wrong. Just get in the book. Teach a Bible study and let the word work. Because I promise you, this word is more powerful than any of our word all compiled together. I didn't understand it when I was younger. My pastor used to tell me that in pastor, he said, time is your best friend. And time is your best friend in working with people. He said, because some people are going to take more time than others, but everybody's going to take time. But in the fullness of time and with a person's right heart, the word of God will work. So, so we can't, we can't equate that, you know what, man, if you're, you're a fast learner, sit up here at the front. Uh, you're, you're a slow learner. Just sit back there at the back. We'll get to you eventually. No, we just all gather together. We learn and we grow together and from one another and in the presence of God because God, and it brings peace to our lives. I say it, I say it to our, our newer converts, new believers, new families. Just keep coming. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Just keep coming. Yeah, that's right. Don't quit. Yeah. Why? Because I know if they keep coming, they're going to keep getting the word. Right. They're going to keep feeling the presence of God. And somewhere, whatever hard part of their heart is keeping that word from sinking. I'm, I, just hear me. I got more than enough seed to go around. Yeah, that's right. I'm not going to run out of the word. We're not going to run out of the hope that is in Jesus Christ. So we're just going to keep piling it on and piling it on until somewhere their heart gets soft. It begins to open up and that seed goes down deep. And the next thing you know, they're going to walk in one service and we're going to see them begin to blossom in the Holy Ghost. Folks, we just got to keep looking. Why? Because we know the peace of God. But he said again, seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said... Are you not much better than they? He said, are you not better than a bird? Come on. I've seen some bird brains, but, but not in here. And I've seen some flighty people, but not in here. And I've seen some people get their feathers ruffled. Maybe some in here. But God said, you, you're, you're better than a bird. Why? He said, that bird doesn't have a soul. That bird's not going to live forever. He said, so just recognize if I will provide for the insignificant. Come on. Do you really think for one moment I'm going to let you down? Be at peace. All right, let's keep reading here. I'm never going to get through all this stuff. Which of you... By taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature. Little interpretation is you're, you're in some kind of hole. You're in some kind of depression. You're in some kind of a need. And he said it don't matter how much you think about it and worry about it. He said it's not going to lift you up not one ounce. When you get through with all your worry, all your thinking, staying up all night, wringing your hands, biting your fingernails, scratching your head, yelling at your family. Talking bad to yourself. You'll understand the words. That cursing everybody in sight. And I'm not talking about with lewd language. Just you, everybody's a problem. He said when you get through with all that. He said you're still going to be right where you were. He said so don't worry about it. 
Because your trust is not in yourself and not in those people. Your trust is in me. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Man, this is good stuff. Yes, he said, so why take your thought for your raiment? What you're going to wear. How you're going to be covered and provided for. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. He said, the flowers are the same way. Let's go keep moving. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory, everything that he had, wisest man that ever lived, wealthiest of, of all time, he said he was not arrayed like one of them. He said, you just look out at what I create and these flowers are beautiful and they don't dress themselves. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? He said, when you start worrying about how you're going to survive, oh now are you ready for this? He said, you're no longer a worrier, you're walking in doubt. He said, my concern is no longer with your inability to assess your own ability, but rather your inability to assess my ability to take care of you. It's no longer a question of, well, you know what, I'm just a failure because I can't know. He said, you're saying I'm a failure because you don't think I'm taking good enough care of you. He said, I need you to go back and make sure that you're in right relationship with me. He said, because I take care of my own. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? He said, just skip that whole chapter. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. These, the Gentiles at this point representing those that were godless. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first. He said it's a priority issue. It's a relationship issue. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So he makes it real simple. He said if you want the peace that the angels testified was coming. He said it's glory to God in the highest. It's put my kingdom first. And when you put my kingdom first and my righteousness, because let me just say, I've got a whole lot of people want to talk about the kingdom of God, but they do not walk in righteousness. You cannot separate the two. Because the kingdom of God is not unrighteous. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So you got, you got, to, you got to keep it all in alignment. But he said, when you are doing that, he said, then all these other things are going to be added unto you. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just skimming over here. It's a whole other subject in time. But again, part of the righteousness of God is God's financial plan, giving of tithe and offering and into the kingdom of God. That's part of what is right and righteous. Sure. So he said, when you, when, you, when you give everything back into my kingdom the way that I taught and said it should be done, he said, you can be at perfect peace with how your life is going to turn out and my ability to provide for you. Can I get anybody in here that will be a witness today and say, you know what? God knows how to take care of his people. Well, I, got, I got a few of you here. Okay, all right. Well, that's all right. We'll work on the rest of you. Praise God. All right, let's go to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing. That word careful, anxious. Be anxious about nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, talking to God about what, whatever it is that you should have been anxious about but chose not to because you're trusting God in peace to provide. But in everything by prayer and supplication, now I'm praying about it. I'm telling God my needs with thanksgiving. But wait a minute, I'm still praying about it, but I'm... But I'm saying thank you? And that's, that's like me looking at my wife and saying, Sweetheart, I want you to know I really need a 2022 Z06 Corvette. And I just want to thank you right now because it's going to be so nice. In the... Folks, that ain't happening. That would be, she's not, but if she were God, that would be praying amiss because he would say, you missed the target, boy. He might say, do you need a little Volkswagen? <laughs> but, but this is literally the, the connotation of what is being said here. He's saying, I expect you to recognize what your needs are. 
and be at peace, not worrying about it, in coming to me in prayer, diligent prayer, heartfelt prayer, and asking me to provide for you. And just go ahead and thank me because that's exactly what I'm going to do is take care of you. He's giving you his word that he will take care of you. This, folks, this is awesome. We got a whirlpool of people trying to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow. Am I going to lose everything? Is the world going to turn upside down? Is the economy going to crash? You know what? The earthly economy, it may crash. That may be the only way to ever find any right to all the mess going on. But God's economy will never crash. He said he has never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. We don't have to worry about because God is in control of our economy. Amen. Oh, Lord. Woo. Man, i got to hurry here. Hang on, I'm just trying to check the time here. Oh, i still got a few minutes. All right, we're good. Let's go to verse 7. Huh. What happened? <laughs> he said, when you stop worrying... And you start praying and thanking me that I am your provider and will provide. He said, the peace of God which passes all understanding. It means the peace of God is going to go right past all the things that you can't figure out. All the things that you say, if he's going to provide for me, it's going to take a bigger miracle than I've ever seen in my life. Folks, I want to tell you, that's the kind of God that we serve. And he said, when you do that, he said, the peace of God is going to come. And he said, it's, oh, Lord, it's going to keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. The need of the season is peace. And that peace comes through fresh trust in him. Let's look at John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He said, you need peace, I'll give it to you. And I'm not giving you the peace that the world can offer, I'm giving you my peace. My peace is tied to my word, to my identity. Folks, you can't get no better than God. You can't get any bigger than God. You can't get anything or anyone that can bless you more than God. That's peace. You know, again, it, it, things are different times of life. But, you know, growing up, my, my papa, and I'm not going to talk about all the bad things, but my, my papa, he... Owned a used car lot. Actually, a couple of them owned a, a wrecking yard, uh, used car parts. And um, from from a boy's perspective, my, my papa had a little bit of money. Now, unfortunately, by the time life was over and with vices of life, he lost everything that he had. But I just, you know, I, I remember sitting down at the end of the evening. It's part of where I, where I learned to count. My papa would come home, and in that day, everybody didn't deal in credit cards; they dealt in cash. So he'd come at the end of the day, I'd be staying with him. We'd sit down, he'd be in his chair, kicked back, having a cigar sticking out of his mouth, just take his little hat off. He'd have me pull his boots off and he'd throw his socks that were full of, full of white talcum powder. He'd throw those and hit me in the face and sometimes throw the cigar and sometimes throw great. It was a great relationship. <laughs> and he'd sit down and he'd say, here boy, it's been a busy day. He said, here, count my money for me. And he'd start emptying his pocket. And he would, I mean, in my mind, looking back, I mean, there would be a stack of cash like that tall. I was just a kid. And I'm literally going, Papa, I got 16 of these. How many is that? <laughs> and I got this many. But in my mind, my Papa, it wouldn't matter what I wanted. My Papa could afford it. So as a boy, I never hesitated if I wanted something to ask him. <laughs> And you know what? My papa never told me no. I'm learning about being a grandpa. It kind of works that way. 
<laughs> but I, I mean, I just, I just thought he had all the resources in the world. It was really heartbreaking as I got older and saw vices of life and they began to strip away from him and realize that you know, he, he couldn't have everything that he wanted anymore. But I'm going to tell you, there has never been one thing in my life that I have ever needed from God. That I asked him for. That he didn't provide. And you know what's even more amazing than that? Is I have preached all over the world. And I am yet to find anybody that says they have found something that God can't do. It's just testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony. Of God's ability to provide. Folks, we have to walk in peace saying, you know what? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's going to be all right because I know who my father is. All right, I got to wrap this up. Mm. I'm going to skip that. Let's go to Matthew 11, 28 and 29. And this is what he says. If you're struggling with the peace that I sent and that I gave and that I brought. He said, I need you to stop worrying and stop trusting. He said, but whatever you're carrying right now, whatever burden, whatever heavy load. He said, I need you to come into peace. He said, so what I need you to do. And I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And this is where we're going to end. He said, I just need you to come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. And he said, I will give you rest. I will put you at peace. I want you to just think about that for one moment. And then I want you to think about whatever burden of life you're carrying. Whatever worry or concern is pressing upon you here this morning. And I'm asking you to lift your hands right now. And I want you with your hands lifted as a semblance of you carrying your burden. <clears throat> it's weighing down on you. But I'm asking you right now to picture God just in front of you with his arms outstretched and saying, here, bring it to me. And I want you right now just to begin to pray. And I want you to take that and I want you to give it to the Lord. I know I'm asking you to create mental images in your mind. Those images are not reality. They're just ways of thinking. But I'm asking you, whatever the burden is, whether it be for children, whether it be for finances, whether it be for health reasons, whatever it is, I'm just asking you to walk it to the Lord right now. Take it to Him and say, okay, God, here it is, because God, I'm not going into that 11 a.m. service. Lord, I'm not going into the 11 o'clock hour and into my tomorrow, God, worrying about something I can't do anything about. But Lord, I'm coming to you in faith right now, and I'm bringing it to you afresh, Lord, and God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would let a fresh spirit of peace cover everybody in this house. Everyone that is willing to engage God this simple word today. I pray, Lord, that you would let them recognize that the need for this season in their life is fresh peace, God. Lord, we pray it for our individual lives. We pray it for our children. We pray it, God, for our world, Lord. God, we cry, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, O Lord on earth as it is in heaven but Lord you came God in your highest and most glorious moment God when you came to earth Lord I pray today let us embrace that afresh and God let there be peace on earth peace in our lives God and Lord thank you for your goodness towards us we praise you today for the hope that we have in your word and everybody say amen, amen.